Officially welcome everyone. Uh, this is the third Passion to Profit Consulting Community webinar. I am excited to have you all here. And today I am really excited to welcome a very special guest that I am honored to have as part of our presentation. So for those of you who are new to me or who've not, who have not met me, I am Caitlin Henze. I am the founder of Passion to Profit Consulting. And with Passion to Profit Consulting, I help organizations shift from annual strategic planning model to more of a continuous strategy iteration. Um, AI is a topic that I have recently become passionate about. Um, Alexis has had the ability to influence some of how I utilize AI. So I will turn it over to you, Alexis, and you can introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here this morning and happy Valentine's Day. Um, I am Alexis Holteen. I'm the founder of Digital by Design. And at Digital by Design, we help um, leaders uh, engage and connect with their customers through technology. And we offer program management, um, strategy, and um, operational efficiency solutions. Awesome. So to get us started, we are going to have a little bit of fun, um, either in the chat or one of your reactions. Pick an emoji that describes how you feel about chat GPT. There is no right or wrong answer, uh, but we are just curious on everyone's gut reaction. Uh, so if you are not super familiar with Zoom, you can add go into the chat feature and click on the little smiley face that's called add emoji and just uh, choose an emoji. <laughs> so we have a little bit of like mind blown. We're not quite sure what it is. Some smiley faces, which is awesome. Maybe a little bit of overwhelm, a little bit of excitement, variety of feelings for sure. Awesome. Some people love it. Some people probably are a little bit nervous about it. So wherever you are on the spectrum is completely fine because today we're going to give you a very short um, introduction on how you can start utilizing ChatGPT as one of the variety of AI tools and help you find some very easy strategies to integrate ChatGPT into your daily work, no matter what function you are a part of. So to get a sense of where we all are at, um, we are going to do a very quick poll. So I'm going to pull up a poll here in a minute. Oops. All right, are you all able to see the poll pop up on your screen? Yes, okay. And this will give you a sense of how you are utilizing ChatGPT currently. Give it another 30 seconds for people to take the poll. All right, so here are our results. Can you all see the results? Yep, okay. Um, so we have a variety of different ways that we are currently utilizing chat GPT. It sound, looks like most are from a writing standpoint, whether it's reading emails or drafting content. Um, the next poll we will take is around our adoption curve. So I am going to launch this next poll. Um, all right, can you all see the second poll? No? Okay, one moment. Let me see if this will work again. Okay, how about now? No? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. All right. We're going to forget that one. We can put it in the chat. Sometimes technology is working and sometimes it doesn't. That one, that poll is just more around, or do you consider yourself an early adopter, a middle adopter, or a late adopter of chat GPT? So if you want to share, you're welcome to put in the chat of where you feel you are at on the adoption curve. Again, no wrong answers. Um, it just is gives us a good sense of, you know, the audience and uh, how they're adopting to ChatGPT. And if you're here, it probably means that you're in the, the middle end of the curve and interested in learning. So yeah, we have a couple, you know, early to mid, we're curious, but we definitely can maybe expand our skill sets or learn how to use utilize it a little bit better. Awesome. So Alexis, I will turn it over to you to give us some introductions into the world of AI. All right. Sounds good. Um, and I was telling Caitlin the other day that I, I couldn't find the numbers, but I had heard on the radio something about the the usage of chat GPT. And um, it was surprisingly low. And if it makes anyone feel any better, my sister was talking to me the other day about um, about, you know, writing a nanny job description. And I said, oh, well, why don't you just use chat GPT? And she said, what is that? So if you're here, you're ahead of a lot of folks. Um, so don't don't be worried about that. Um, I am really excited to talk to you a little bit about um, AI and help break down some of the jargon that you're hearing in the media and by tech companies um, and help you understand how it applies to the tech that you're using or will be using. So if we go to the next slide, I've got um, some some really big words and some really big font. And I wanted to, to just give you some background on what these mean. And um, so let's start with, with artificial intelligence or AI. Think of AI as simply advanced computer systems. Um, what we're seeing today is predominantly uh, machine learning, which is the, you know, the driving force be behind all of these AI apps that we're seeing. Um, machine learning is, is basically, um, you know, training computers to learn um, from, from data. And um, it's computers that are performing tasks that if, if performed by a human requires some level of intelligence. And what do I mean by trained on data? Well, we give it lots and lots of examples to learn from. So, um, Let's take the example of uh, we want to teach a computer to recognize, uh, to identify the image of a cat. We give it thousands and thousands of images, and each one we say, this is a cat, this is a cat. And eventually we give it a new image, and it's able to distinguish the image of a cat from other details in, in a photo. So if you think about AI um, in the news today, it's really just teaching computers to learn and do tasks, which if you think about it is probably part of many of the tools and services that, that you're using already. All right, let's talk about large language models. So LLMs are uh, a model that predicts what comes next in a sequence of words. And these models are trained on millions of books, articles, websites to understand what is most likely to come next. So let's take the phrase, um, I had a great day at the dot, dot, dot. If we had a model that was trained on enough data, it might be able to predict beach or park. And what you're seeing out in the marketplace today are uh, LLMs that have gotten really, really, really good at guessing what comes next. The, the last term that I just want to talk about and break down is generative AI. And uh, a generative model takes what it's learned from examples and it creates something new. Um, large language models, LLMs, are a type of generative AI. And I saw in people's polls that a lot of the ways that we're using it is through generating you know, novel text, but um, it's not just text. You can also use it for images like Dolly. You can use it for audio and, and video as well. Um, okay, so now we've got all these words in our back pocket broken down a little bit. Let's go to the, to the next slide. And 
you may be surprised that you've already been using AI for a while now. Um, so again, if we think about AI as just an advanced computer system, well, you know, you've, you've probably used Siri or an equivalent. Um, Alexa is not allowed in my house because that's confusing. So we have Google. Uh, we also have um, things like, you know, your Spotify playlists, and then it recommends um, based on what you listen to. You've probably used some sort of chat bot before. And in Gmail, maybe you've used some of the suggestions, the auto completes to, to finish an email. Those are all examples of AI. Um, however, <laughs> what changed was at the end of 2022, ChatGPT hit the scene. And this was just an exponential leap in some of the capabilities that we've seen and um, actually you know, had access to. And this really changed the game for, for a lot of ways that, that we work. And if we go to the next slide, what, what I'd like to do is um, specifically spend this session talking about ChatGPT, because if there's one generative AI model out there that you use, so you know if you're worrying about, oh, where should I be? I've heard all of these new startups and things like that. The, the, the place to start is ChatGPT. And this is really, you know, the place where, where you can get the most out of it. I have not seen equivalent models, maybe Gemini out there. That's Google's version. Um, but we're going to talk about ChatGPT just to simplify things. Um, you can use, I noticed that some of you have not used ChatGPT or, you know, not used it a whole lot. Some of you guys look like you probably, you know, this is going to be old news to you. But there is a way to be thoughtful about how you use ChatGPT. And this starts with accuracy. So just recognizing that everything that you get back from ChatGPT is not always accurate. Um, they are updating the model. So it used to be like 2021, the information was up to, but now it's more recent, April of 2023. Um, but just be skeptical about what you're seeing returned. And as for me, for example, uh, my, I practice, I've never asked ChatGPT things that I can't verify. So I'm not going to go in and say, hey, write me a LinkedIn post about the top reasons why you should code in Python, because I have no idea if it's going to tell me 100% false information or there's just going to be one little line that's wrong. So think about... Um, Think about kind of having a critical eye towards the content that's being returned. The next thing to think about, and especially I saw um, some of you are um, focused in the HR departments. Uh, this is probably something that you've, not, you know, this isn't the first time you've heard this, but think about bias. So um, when when ChatGPT was trained, right, it, it was given millions and millions of, of books and articles and things on the internet. To, to be trained on. And all of those things, probably some of them at least, had some inherent bias in it. I don't know if it was trained on you know, this job posting, but this is an example of where there's some bias in here, some gender bias, that as you maybe ask ChatGPT to help create the first draft of a job posting, you may see a return back to you. So that's again, a, a human element where you need to, to read through the content and really think, about what you're seeing returned. And the last, the last thing here is, um, is around uh, privacy and confidentiality. So um, it, G chat GPT records everything you type in and you can turn off your chat history and do a few other settings. But if you read the privacy policy, which I did, you just assume that you are sharing your information that you're putting in there with a whole list of different people that you may or may not know. So what does that mean? Does it mean don't use it? In my opinion, no. Um, it just requires an extra step and that's um, cleansing whatever you put in. So um, if you have a company name, I just do a quick find in Word, maybe throw it in there and replace the company name with company X. If you have people names, replace it with person Z. Um, I don't put any confidential information in there that I think could be linked to an individual or a company. So I might just leave that um, section out. 
but those are just, you know, it's an extra step, but those are ways that you're making sure that you're maintaining um, the privacy and confidentiality of your company or your clients or whoever you're working with. How many of you out of curiosity have worked for a company that maybe prohibits use of chat GPT for that reason, or who is skeptical or, or doesn't allow employees to use the tool because of, of confidentiality? Couple. See a hand. Yes. So, and, and that's, yeah, the, that's interesting. Um, I think we're, my perspective on this is we are going to see this evolve as more, more tips come out in how we can protect company confidentiality while putting data into chat GPT. I know the last company that I worked for was skeptical of it. And so they said, if you want to use it, you have to use it on your own personal email address. You cannot put your company name, email address into and create a chat GPT account based on that. Um, and if there is you know, anything that is con confidential or company confidential, you're absolutely not allowed to put that in chat GPT at all. So the process that I started that was at least helpful is if I was using it for business purposes and I had a whole lot of data, whether it was bullet point meeting notes or survey data, I would copy that, put it into a Word document, use find and replace, as Alexa said, replace all the company names, all the people names, all the dollar figure name amounts, um, anything to make it very blanket sort of data or statement, put that into chat GPT and ask it to write me a summary of something or analyze a specific data point set and then, you know, cleanse it again. The one piece that I've gotten used to, you know, doing in my mind, the double check is, you know, if I do all those steps to cleanse the data, is it actually going to save me time and be more efficient? In some cases, the answer is yes. In some cases, the answer is no. And when the answer is no, then I just know in my brain, I've gotten used to knowing the specific tasks that it's actually going to be more efficient for me to just read through this information and write a summary or create a slide deck with content based on it because of all of the various steps. Um, but in some cases, the answer is, yeah, it actually will be more efficient, even though I'll have to go back in and do some modifications. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, there's Well, there's a couple of things here. I'll also share my experience with um, working with a, a large retailer. They have their own instance of basically chat GPT mm -hmm. that um, has you know, kind of a, it must be a, their own server or something that it's running on, but the same model, or it feels like a similar model. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing. And then to your comments about uh, maybe it's going to, you're going to spend more time doing all of the translating. Absolutely. And you will know those moments um, when you've kind of passed and you're like, oh my God, I should have just written that myself. <laughs> 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 there's there's definitely those moments, but you have to just get in there and recognize, you know, what are your strengths? And maybe, you know, for example, if I'm working late at night and I just don't have it in me to come up with something, I may lean on chat GPT more than if I was on my first cup of coffee during the day. Exactly. All right. Um, in my opinion, AI is not coming for your job as it exists today. <laughs> so if anyone's fearful about that, um, just, just think of, of ChatGPT as, um, I love this example or this analogy, as an overconfident intern. So someone who's showing up on day one is like, hey, how can I help? How can I help? <laughs> and you're like, okay, okay. Um, you know, I've got some things for you to do, right? So uh, it's not going to replace you. But I do want to call out that I think that humans who do not use AI in their workplace will be replaced by humans who start using AI. And, and that you'll start seeing. So um, obviously you guys care enough to be here, but I think this is a really important skill that you just start learning um, and also understand what are the capabilities, right? This is not gonna, we're not all gonna be sitting, you know, on 
remote control cars or whatever floating around while AI runs the world in, in five years. We're a ways away from that. <laughs> And the piece to the roles that it can play are, are quite varied. Um, as Alexis mentioned, the future top talent will be humans plus AI. So rather than thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose my job because it's going to be replaced by a bunch of robots or our whole department will be eliminated because there will be no need for it. There are certainly a place, there, there is a place and will continue to be a place for the human element in businesses. And we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end in terms of the competencies that we as humans are going to need to accelerate in order to be more successful in working with AI in the future. Um, however, as we explore the role that this overconfident intern can play for us, there are a variety of different types of scenarios we may want to use them in. As some of you mentioned in the poll in the beginning, sounds like a lot of us are using it to create content or be a thought starter, maybe be a, you know, a first draft pass at an email. A couple of my favorite new uh, sort of roles that I have used ChatGPT for, um, one is to kind of provide feedback or be a, a simulator for a conversation that I might be having. So if I am feeling very fired up and I draft an email back in my fit of fury, I can feed that back into ChatGPT and ask it, the tone of the email or ask it, you know, what, what the reaction might be or how this email sounds, or I could even ask it, can you put this language in a nicer, kinder way? Um, not that I typically write a lot of very angry emails, um, but we've all been there when we fire a response back and wish that we may have thought about it a little bit more. One of the other, uh, one of my other new favorite tools is the AI companions in a lot of our meeting features. I use Zoom. Zoom has an AI companion that takes notes while you're having the meeting and talking. So when I'm working with a variety of clients and I want to be engaged in the conversation and not have to worry about writing things down in my notebook, I can th very thankfully rely on the summary from AI that's in the background and then put that summary potentially into ChatGPT if I need it to be written in a more complete sentence form or jog my memory to fill in the gaps. So those are a couple of my new favorite ways. Um, I'll invite anyone who feels comfortable to either come off mute or put in the chat some of your favorite recent ways that you have used ChatGPT? Does anyone have some fun examples? Well, people, it looks like people are typing. Um, I'll yes. offer, <laughs> I'll yep, offer creating SOPs. Yeah. Oh, those are great. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Content. I love the vac vacation itinerary planning. That's a good one. I'll have to use that. Yep. Changing tones of emails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really good examples in the chat um, that all of you can take. Um, these are also some, some examples that we can go off of. So we are now going to switch into some example sharing to give you a success story um, with some data anal of, of how you would use ChatGPT for some data analyzation. Yeah, and I noticed, Bill, that you're thinking about using it um, as well for financial analysis. So this may be interesting to you. This is just a quick recording. Um, I've got a Excel spreadsheet that, I don't know, is 20 something rows. I created the headers and I actually, fun fact, had ChatGPT create um, random data for me. So if you guys are creating surveys and you're not quite sure how people might respond to a question, you can always ask ChatGPT to give you guys a few sample responses and see if that's how it's interpreting what your question was. Um, so we've got this spreadsheet and, um, you can see that we've got some names. So one of the first things that we'll do is delete those names um, from the spreadsheet. So we wanna cleanse it. 
And um, then we've got some other rows. I just kind of intentionally made some numbers, some yes, no's. And then the last um, column, excuse me, is open text. So um, that's often, imagine this is, you know, a fake employee sentiment survey, but imagine you've got 2000 rows of this and you've got the results back now and you want to create an executive slide for the next leadership meeting. So I'm scanning here, making sure that there's no company names or PII, you know, personally identifiable information, nothing like that. Then I head over to chat GPT. And um, I am not a prompt engineer. Um, I actually have, have had a few moments of like fear of, am I doing this right? But I think you just kind of start typing and <laughs> have that conversation, right? Like it's an intern, like, no, I mean this, this and back and forth and you'll get there. So don't worry about that. So I said, you know, something along the lines of act as an HR professional and giving a little bit of context, um, grab the Excel that I've, you know, cleansed, attach that. And, um, and I've got, I've also got a grammar editor running in the background. So it's going to help me with a few things. And um, so then I finish up, you know, my, my initial ask here and you'll see what happens. Um, by the way, I did cut this video a little bit because it does not analyze in like one second, it might take 10, but for your benefit, I trimmed that a little bit, <laughs> but you'll see that it's already giving me back just with that simple prompt. Um, and I even misspelled themes, right. And it still understood what I was asking. So you, you can find, I find that I have very bad questions of it and it still gets it, um, which is awesome. So you'll see that it's already given me back. Um, some of, it, well, sorry, to start with, whenever you're asking for it to analyze data, it will make sure, it will go back and make sure that it's interpreting and validate how it's interpreting that data. So basically it's like a read back to you of that. Um, so I'm like, yes, that's right. That makes sense. Keep going. So now it's going to give me some of the um, qualitative and quantitative insights here. And again, these are things that I might just Again, like the quantitative, I could probably run a quick formula in Excel. I'm actually terrible at Excel, so I might use this, but um, I would grab things like um, the job satisfaction, the average score. Maybe that goes into my PowerPoint. Um, it also gives you a little bit of takeaway too. So I might say, hmm, I kind of like how that's phrasing. I might take that and iterate off of that. Um, and then it starts giving some of the some of the themes in the open text. And this is the part that I find really powerful when, you know, you've got just like rows and rows of open text, for example, to to analyze or sort or to find themes in. And so it goes through and it, it gives me all of those. Again, I am going to also still go through the survey and read through the columns. Um, and make sure that it's not missing any themes. I might tweak things, but let's say for, um, for some of the numerical pieces, I want to actually create a graph. And this is where you can go back and forth. I only went one time into it and asked for it to do, um, for it to give me a graph, but um, I have done, done it where I've said, oh, can you make the chart title larger? Can you change the, color of the bars to, and you know, whatever font or excuse me, like, you know, color. Can you change from a vertical bar to a horizontal bar? Um, so these, I can, you can see it's, it's kicked out graphs that I could easily copy and paste straight into my presentation. And I've, I've used a similar um, process. I've run online workshops where we've all been at a digital whiteboard and everyone's putting their ideas on sticky notes and things like that. In real time, while people are going around kind of and the round robin and talking about what they put down on the board, I do a quick export. I'm making sure there's no information with names, usually just, you know, ideas or something. I feed that into chat GPT and I say, give me themes. And while they're talking, I can go back and just as a single person, I can go back and I can start organizing sticky notes into themes while they're talking. Again, it's like an extra hand here. So this is a productivity boost, not, not a replacer. Any questions or, or comments? All 
All right. I hope feel free to throw some questions um, in the chat as as I hope this is generating some more some more ideas on how you could potentially use this. Uh, Caitlin, I'll hand it back over to you. Sure. So as Alexa showed, there's a variety of different ways that we can utilize ChatGPT. Um, I know for me and in my work, I have in the past spent hours and hours and hours pulling over, pouring over survey data in order to try to, to get some of the key themes or to analyze that. And, you know, this video that Alexa showed was, you know, doing it in about five to 10 minutes, let's just say. So um, it does help create efficiency, which is amazing. And I encourage all of you to start using it in small ways in order to discover where it does create efficiency and where it is helpful, and then discover ways where truly just being a human and using our brain power is actually the most effective tool. So to help us wrap up, um, I'll leave us with a quote, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about where humans come in. So this is a Maya Angelou quote that essentially says, you know, people will forget a lot of the facts and actions that you take, um, but what will resonate with them is how you make them feel. So where we come in as humans, that is not one of the superpowers of ChatGPT, is that we can read emotions and we have the ability to navigate conversations and conduct workshops and do our work in a way that brings that human element in. So in order to be successful as top talent going forward, we need to one partner with AI to help us be more efficient and effective in our daily jobs. And then two, learn where we can use our superpowers and strengths to make that combination even more synergistic. So there's a couple of competencies that research has shown recently that will be more important than ever for us as humans to become strong in over the next couple of years as AI continues to evolve. So a few of the ones listed here, uh, we already know are important to the workplace, but will become even increasingly more important. I'll call out just a couple of them. Um, the creativity and, and curiosity piece is something that, you know, ChatGPT can't necessarily do. As Alexis mentioned, you know, it's trained based on the data that it has. So it doesn't necessarily think outside of the box and come up with new innovative solutions. So there's still a lot of power for us as humans getting into a room and using a variety of techniques to problem solve and take certain ideas and solutions that maybe were originally generated by ChatGPT and build off of those. Uh, the other piece is just the compassion and the empathy. Um, ChatGPT can't feel any certain way towards a certain person. So if you do ask it some to, to help generate some talking points to have a difficult performance conversation with an employee or give you some tips on having a discussion with someone that you disagree with, just take into account that ChatGPT has no idea how the other person might feel or how they might react to what you are saying. So we still need to bring our humanity and not just fully read on the script, but navigate the conversation based on our emotional intelligence and awareness of the other person. Uh, the other piece with ChatGPT is it can't help us build relationships across various stakeholder groups within our business. Depending on the role that you're in, you probably work with either internal customers or external customers, even a variety of different vendors and partners. And we can use ChatGPT to generate content, but ultimately our success in our jobs will rely upon us being able to build relationships and establish trust and credibility with the people that we are working with. And ChatGPT can't necessarily help us with that. So if you're looking to grow in your career or if you have a team that you support and you're looking for some competencies or soft skills, as we sometimes call them, to help them evolve, this is a great place to start um, because this is something that, at least in my opinion, we will never be able to have AI completely cover.
So we will go ahead and wrap up and also um, allow time for any questions that you might have. Um, we will leave you with a couple of quick tips for getting started in using ChatGPT. Um, but before we kind of go through those parting tips and how to get started today, does anyone have any trickling thoughts or questions that you came up with um, after, you know, watching the last 30-ish minutes of our, our presentation. Anything that's top of mind? Or Alexis, anything that you want to add? Yeah, I guess maybe um, just start using it. <laughs> and um, start using you know, chat GPT, don't spend time going all over trying to use different tools. Just start with chat GPT and uh, start using it. And, um, and I would say, yeah, I, you know, I don't know if you have something to add to, I saw you raise your hand. Hi everyone. Yeah, I found it quite helpful and time-saving for certain things, but you definitely have to go through again and make sure that the data is, um, relevant and, and concise and like the way that you want the information that you want to give away. So I found it very helpful so far, but yeah, it takes like the first step to just overcome that little fear. And then you, and then it's really nice to rely, to rely on it for your day by day work. In my opinion. Yeah. And uh, Ahmed, I saw that you're thinking about it from an academia point of view. Um, I think that they should. And um, I think that if any professor is not aware of ChatGPT capabilities, their students most surely are <laughs> and are using it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've thought about this topic a lot because it's very concerning to me. You know, when I talked about some of the things that you need to go in using a product like ChatGPT with, you need to be able to verify its accuracy. My kids don't know enough to be able to verify accuracy. So I do think that there's this kind of scarier alternative where you start having people um, who are using products like ChatGPT but aren't able to verify the accuracy. And there in of itself is, is a big challenge. So I think in academia, it's um, again, teaching folks how to make it a partner but not lean on it to create content that you can't verify. Um, so I'm sure there's more aspects than that, but I've, I've thought about, you know, for example, my kids using it and that, that would be a mess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Bill, to your point, you know, there, there is the, the free version, um, and there is a newer version that came after the initial version in November, 2022, that is chat GPT four, um, that has a paid account. I have heard some rumors that in the future, I don't know when, that all of chat, that like there will be no such thing as being able to use it for free. I don't know if and when that will happen. Um, however, it is, I think the, the free component gives us the ability to even take it with a, a grain of salt even more in a sense, um, because there's not a lot of monitoring in what the data is and who's putting data in and where it's pulling that. Um, and that's, I think, why they develop the, the chat GPT-4 to give us a lot more capabilities. And, and OpenAI is making a lot of money already with just a fraction of us using it. Um, I, I, I think I heard the several billion they just made, but um, I don't quote me on that. I, I should, I should look that up, but um, you know, they're, they're paying for subscriptions, then um, they're also, you know, that model that they've got underneath chat GPT, for example, at the retailer that is my client right now, they've got uh, a standalone version where I'm sure that they're paying some money to open AI to be able to use that model in their own environment. Um, so there's ways that, that open AI is monetizing it. Um, and we could talk a whole lot more about this concept of GPTs, which is sort of like the app store now um, within chat GPT itself, where people are creating their own um, kind of quick prompts and sort of chat GPT personalities for a very specific task that they've already sort of fine tuned for you. And I'm sure that those will um, also go for some sale, sort of sale soon. Right now, I think they're free. 
So we'll leave you with a couple of tips to help you get started or to help you further your chat GPT usage if you already are getting started. And we will share a copy of the slides so you will all have these direct links. Um, there's a very short YouTube video that we've linked here and just how to create an account in general if you have not yet done so. Um, we do recommend that you bookmark it. And then uh, with forming a habit, um, it takes some daily usage. So we're recommending that you start trying to use it daily. Um, if your organization does prohibit its use or block it on your work computer, you can certainly start using it on a personal device and start using it for some personal type activities. Um, someone in the in the chat had mentioned, you know, vacation itinerary planning. So there's so many ways that you can utilize it. Um, I know I've, you know, used it to craft emails or messages that I send to family members, things like that. So just start in some small ways, whether it's personal or professional. Um, and then if you really are curious, and if today little demo of the summer, the summary data analysis piqued your interest, um, create a, a 4.0 account. Uh, I know I did that probably four or five months ago now, and am very glad that I did because it has so many more capabilities that I did not get in the 3.0 count. So if you uh, want to take your, your learning even farther, there is a newer version that gives you even more capabilities. All right. Well, we are right at time. Um, anything else that you want to add, Alexis? No, I just appreciate everyone showing up and, um, you know, curious to learn more, more about this topic that um, I'm currently nerding out on. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. I hope you have a great rest of the day. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>